Κυρίες και κύριοι καλησπέρα σας, άλλη μία εκπομπή θέματα υγείας ξεκινάει απόψε στο Hellenic TV όπως κάθε Κυριακή κοντά σας στις 7.30 το βράδυ. Απόψε είναι μία ιδιαίτερη εκπομπή, πρώτον γιατί έχω έναν ξεχωριστό καλεσμένο και δεύτερον γιατί η εκπομπή ενώ συνήθως οι εκπομπές μας είναι στα ελληνικά θα είναι στα αγγλικά γιατί είναι και ο προσκεκλημένος μας Άγγλος. Tonight we have invited a distinguished cardiology, which I was I had the honor to work with him at least four years, Dr. Stuart Rosen. Um, I have to say, and I want to say that in public, um, I have never told you <laughs> directly. Um, you are not amazing as a doctor, but as, as a personality, you influenced me and many other doctors in such a way from your personality, your kind manners. We have discussed that so many times when we were working with you. And tonight, I feel really honored having you here. I know you're extremely busy and you made time for us. So it's a great honor for all of us having you here. Well, thank you for asking me. You've, you've made me blush within the first two minutes of the interview. So. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I'm very honest. You know me very I well. Do. After I a few do. years, you know that I'm very Absolutely. honest. So Absolutely. I need you to say that. Thank it's you. amazing to have people like you in medicine and your knowledge and also one of the things uh, I appreciate in you is your, your amazing stunning knowledge in history of medicine. Well, I think that uh, the only way of understanding any subject really is to know where yes. it comes from. It's, it's very and, true. And uh, of course the Greek tradition of medicine is one of the oldest and it noblest. Is. It is, it and is. We, have to, we are proud of that. And I'm sure that. you're brought up on that with, with uh, very appropriate pride. Um, but the history of medicine is a fascinating area because what you can do is see where other people had useful ideas, which ideas didn't go very far, why they didn't. And the other thing which you'll notice as the years go by is that things run in cycles. It's very so true. So even within cardiology, there are 25, 30 year cycles of fashionability of different ideas. Yeah. Certain things come back. You hope the next, each time it comes back, it comes back more refined and more thought out and with a greater evidence base than previously. But uh, it is quite helpful to have a perspective. I'm way. sure you will be part of that great history for many, many years. People will be talking about okay. you. But I want people to know a few things about you. Um, Dr. Stuart Alderson was born here in North England. He studied at Cambridge, one distinguished. Um, university and famous. He trained in most large centres of West London in cardiology. He is a consultant in general adult cardiology with special interest in heart failure and that's one big part I had the honour to work with him. Syncope, hypertension, he has done a lot of research in those and he has a special interest in brain-heart interactions. He's a reader at Imperial and currently he's consultant at Ealing Hospital where he's also clinical director. He's consultant at Royal Brompton. He has his own private practice for all of you ladies and gentlemen who could be interested in Royal Brompton Hospital and Wellington Hospital as well. Tonight we will mainly discuss about heart failure and then at the end we will discuss something really unique and very innovative in cardiology, cardiac oncology. So Dr. Rosen, tell us about heart failure, the definition and some causes. Well heart failure in the simplest of terms is a situation in which the heart cannot provide the output that the body or the patient needs at a normal operating pressure. The heart might dilate and become overloaded with fluid and uh, therefore work at a higher volume. That's the sort of heart failure that most of the textbooks cover quite easily where you see an enlarged heart on a chest x-ray, on a cardiac ultrasound you see the heart poorly contracting and in response to this, the body brings into play a number of compensatory mechanisms. 
The, the body is very well prepared with mechanisms that can cope with sudden bleeding and loss of flow through the circulation. But heart failure is an unusual situation in which lack of forward flow is interpreted by the body as a bleed and measures to compensate for that are brought into play, either short-term measures to constrict blood vessels to raise blood pressure or to retain fluid through salt and water retention through the kidney. Now, obviously, if that is maintained over a period of time, it will produce a lot of different symptoms of breathlessness, of fluid congestion, and altogether that syndrome, that group of symptoms, is what comprises heart failure. I started that by describing it in terms of a dilated, poorly functioning heart, because that's quite easy to understand, and that's uh, the um, at the core of literally thousands of research papers and a very good evidence base on what is the best treatment. More recently, we've also recognized that the heart may look a normal size Indeed. and may contract apparently normally, but does so at a higher pressure within the chambers, so-called heart failure with preserved contractile function. <coughs> and that might count for up to 50% of cases that come into hospital. And for this disorder, we have very few evidence-based, few if any, evidence-based treatments. So and we yet, could miss the diagnosis? We could miss the diagnosis. Um, we certainly have many, many cases coming into our hospital beds of patients with this heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. And it's a major challenge to come up with a treatment that works. The key to the diagnosis there, as in much of uh, heart failure work, is ultrasound, is cardiac echo. Uh, and that actually uh, gives you the definition of that, of that particular disorder. Would you like to tell us um, a few causes of the heart failure? Which are, sure. which are the most common mainly? Well, the commonest cause of heart failure in, in the Western world is actually ischemic heart disease. It's narrowing of the heart arteries, heart attacks, damage to the heart muscle so that there are areas of scar and the other parts of the heart have to compensate and work harder and over time they are become a little worn out and this is the process which used to be known as remodeling that the heart dilates and the various areas do not work quite as well as they ought to. Um, that's probably 60-70% of cases in Western Europe. There are other well-recognized causes Uncontrolled blood pressure over a number of years is probably the second commonest cause. Um, valve, so the ischemic group might be 70% of cases, the hypertensive group may be 15-20% of cases. Then we get down to, to valve disease, 5-10%. to 10 And then there are other important causes such as um, alcohol, uh, alcoholic cardiomyopathy. There are a small group of patients who develop severe heart failure, often in their younger years, for reasons that aren't apparent at all. These have been called idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. We suspect that there may be viruses at the base of it. And then there are also other groups uh, of patients where there is an identifiable cause. And in your introduction, you kindly made mention of cardio-oncology which is a new discipline yes. we'll talk about a little later, but one in which there is a very clear toxic cause to the heart muscle's dysfunction, and that toxic cause in some patients has been the chemotherapy that they underwent. May I ask you, because I remember in your clinics I ha we have seen young patients with uh, cardiomyopathy, yes. and obviously there are some hereditary factors, yes. and we send them... Um, to refer them to professors for further investigations and then the whole family um, had to be investigated. Yes, absolutely. How often are these? Thank thankfully, they're not very often, but uh, there is a clear pattern in some families where you see that uh, there might be a pattern of, of, of early onset heart failure, there might be a pattern of sudden death in some families. Um, they, they, they are rarities, and thank God they are rarities, but we selectively will see more than average in the units in which you and I have worked together. Yeah. Um, 
the characterization of the genetic basis of those disorders has gone a certain distance, but I would not say that we have genetic markers even for half of these yet. Um, and some of them, there is an interaction with something else. For example, uh, if you take hemochrom hemochromatosis, mm -hmm. where the heart might be overloaded with iron, iron. Um, that might not develop in someone who isn't exposed to a lot of iron through repeated transfusions, for example. Um, but uh, I think we're, we're acquiring a more detailed knowledge of these, you know, from our basic science colleagues uh, each year. And genetics will d get more involved, you think, in the following years? I, would they prevent...? I, 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 think, I think you're right that, that uh, certainly genetic uh, characterization of patients will become an increasing issue. Um, ideally, if one could um, identify particular genetic tendencies, uh, especially where there is a cofactor such as iron or something else mm -hmm. or a particular drug, you could uh, prevent these from emerging by seeing that the patient isn't exposed to those particular triggers. Um, ultimately, there is a hope that one might be able to treat patients with um, replacement of them or alteration of the affected gene by conveying that into the patient through what's called a viral vector that the missing gene will be put into a virus, the virus will, tr will, will be applied to the patient and um, the missing ingredient will be put back into the mix. And this sounds very much like science fiction, Indeed. but there are actually trials underway at the moment. There's this trial with a great interest in uh, a substance named CERCA, S-E-R-C-A, uh, looking at calcium metabolism in okay. cardiomyopathic cells and that is uh, already underway as a national trial. That's amazing, that's the first time I've heard mm, about that. It's very interesting. So we have to see, we will see many many things in the next few yeah, years. Yeah. And when you, um, we have some diagnostic tools, we know from your department, I had also this honour to get trained partially in cardiac echo because it needs a lot of experience and a lot of practice to get there mm. but I know it's the main diagnostic tool to do echocardiogram for your diagnosis. Generally, do we have anything else adding to that? Can you tell us a few words about the importance of echocardiogram in your diagnosis of heart failure? Yeah. Well, the, the definition of heart failure is the demonstration of dysfunction of the heart in relation to the symptoms that we observe. Clinically, we you mean? Yeah. So the clinical, the clinical definition is that, for example, from the European Society of Cardiology, requires one to de demonstrate that the heart is not working as well as it should. And ECHO is a beautiful tool. It is a tool that allows you to see structure and function immediately at the bedside, in real time. It's safe. There's no risk to the patient from radiation or anything like that. As you indicate, and you've acquired a lot of skills yourself, it is an operator-dependent technique. It is not easy to learn echo, and uh, high standards are required to come up with useful, useful data. There are other techniques of imaging which are emerging. Cardiac magnetic resonance scanning, cardiac MRI, is probably now the gold standard for looking at anatomy of the heart. It also is allowing an increasing, uh, increasingly detailed assessment of function and more recently has allowed us to look at blood flow through the heart muscle as well. So we have perfusion scanning with cardiac MRI and we can characterize the muscle as well. For example, to demonstrate whether there is scar within the muscle such that the tissue is unlikely to recover function or whether it is basically healthy and might do so. Or fibrosis. Or fibrosis, yeah. They will In be which able. case the outlook will be different. Cardiac MRI is, is more cost effective, but echo is simple. But for the completion of diagnosis, do you consider both strictly necessary or let, relatively necessary? I, I certainly don't think that cardiac MRI is necessary in every patient um, for, the, for the diagnosis. If, if it is 
reasonably obvious as to what the underlying cause is. For example, a patient who has had previous heart attacks and we can see the state of the arteries by angiography, we can look at the heart muscle by echo. It is unlikely that a cardiac MRI would necessarily add an awful lot. But in an unusual case, or a young case, or a patient with normal coronaries, where we're really not so sure as to the etiology of the cardiomyopathy, I think it would be very important to do a cardiac MRI, and that would add usefully to to the, the information on which we could put the whole picture together. Yes. Regarding blood, we had, uh, I mean, when I was practicing in hospital, we were using a lot BNP. Yeah. Because we found it as a diagnostic tool. Now, as GP, I have to say, many GPs would consider if I send off a BNP, then I have, and it's high, it's above 400, most likely I have a patient with heart failure. Mm. That makes some people stop examining patients mm. sometimes. They rely on the results mm. because I always look at their feet, legs swelling, yeah. ankles yeah. swelling, yeah. wet sounds, uh, yeah. murmurs. Yeah. But many people say, well, if it sounds like, if I send a BNP, I have the diagnosis. Mm. Would you like to tell us a few things about BNP? Because people would be yeah. wondering when yeah. they're sent off, uh, bloods, if, yeah. uh, what's the importance well, I, of them? I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you raise the question of clinical examination and clinical assessment because it, it is somewhat out of fashion and the quality of bedside examination is not what it used to be. Of course, um, one can't be a, a dinosaur when, you know, many years ago the, that was the only tool available to clinicians and they, ha and they had to use it and they got very good at using bedside skills. Um, the fact that we now have imaging techniques that make it less important shouldn't mean that the clinical skills disappear. I mean, I've told you before the, the uh, somewhat shocking story when I uh, examined a patient with heart failure and a very junior doctor was at the bedside and I asked whether the patient had, a, had a, an enlarged liver and she just wrote on her book, do an ultrasound. I said, well, I can yes. feel for it straight away. I so remember that. You can waste money on doing Indeed. unnecessary tests, that's for sure. But your question actually was focused on BMP. And BMP is a very interesting um, substance. BMP is a hormone, as you know, mm -hmm. secreted by the heart under conditions of stretch, unusual stretch or strain. It's, BNP stands for brain natriuretic peptide because it was first isolated from brain tissue, but actually it really, its, its important physiological role is when it's released from the heart and it acts upon the kidney to encourage a diuresis and that way would actually help to relieve some of the symptoms of heart failure. But as you indicate, an elevation of BMP is usually a very good sign, uh, a test for heart failure. Uh, it's particularly useful that it can be done in primary care and certainly some of the assays such as the NT Pro BNP you could take a blood sample send it off by post have it analyzed two to three days later and come up with your diagnosis it's not the end of the story because you would still then want to do your echo exactly I think probably the most useful application of the BNP test is as a rule out in other words if you find that a patient with such symptoms actually has a normal BMP, then that should make you rather doubtful as to whether the patient really has heart failure, especially in the presence of other normal investigations, simple investigations, such as a chest X-ray uh, or an ECG. If they were mm -hmm. truly normal and the BMP is normal, the likelihood of heart failure is extremely remote. And at that point, one should be considering another cause, such as a respiratory cause for breathlessness. But could it happen to have a borderline BNP, have some symptoms, and despite that, to have heart failure? It could happen. Um, the, the borderline situation is always difficult, as you know. Um, the, the BMP level may be somewhat elevated in artificial circumstances, for example, in the presence of renal disease. Um, renal failure. Yeah. 
And it's <coughs> not, it's not, n none of these is an absolute test, but they're strong indicators. I was just thinking if some uh, people from the audience would think, well, if I have ne negative BNP or borderline, can you exclude heart failure? It's a question I get at the uh, practice, at the GP surgery. Because it, people read all these yeah, and they are looking yeah, at numbers. Yeah, yeah. I think in practical terms, in primary care, if you get a normal BNP and, as I say, your other basic tests are normal, I think that you can heavily reassure your patient that they do not have heart they do failure. Not have. Okay. So, how, uh, tell us a few things uh, about the treatment. And because, you know, uh, in your department, when I was working with you, we had unique opportunities to learn. We will come there. But let's explain to uh, the people who are watching from home how we usually treat okay. uh, heart failure. Well, we can approach this two ways. We can approach mm. through the NICE guidance, which tells you what the official treatment is. Or I could approach it for you historically, which is an interesting angle, is to see what treatments used to be used, what treatments are still used. I always love these discussions with you, and, I have to say, and, on Fridays, and what the they, best discussions. And what they tell you yeah. about our concept of yes. heart failure. Maybe it's a good approach to give uh, the people some idea well, how the first and most started. The first effective treatment for the symptoms of heart failure was the development of diuretics. And they Indeed. go back actually to the time of the Second World War, when there were mercury-based uh, drugs. There was a drug named Mersalyl which was quite an effective diuretic. The only problem was that the patient would then die of renal failure <laughs> because the kidneys were, were damaged. But diuretics became a mainstay of treatment. And the other, even older drug, which was given as standard for heart failure, was digoxin. Yes. The use of which goes back more than 200 years to withering in the 1770s. Digoxin was the product of the foxglove, uh, uh, digitalis purpurea, and now we know that actually its key role is in patients with atrial fibrillation where the atria are contracting chaotically and rapidly and it's to slow down the heart rate response but digoxin was the treatment for dropsy then came along the diuretics in later years the first group of drugs which actually was shown to improve mortality because diuretics did not improve mortality for chronic heart failure and do not improve mortality for chronic heart failure, although they may save lives in That's acute, something important acute to be heard. pulmonary edema. Yeah. The first drugs that actually showed improvement in mortality were the ACE inhibitors. There yes. was trials in the 80s, all the drugs that end in pril, starting yes. with captopril, then in allopril, more recently, ramipril, perindopril, lisinopril. These drugs have been shown to improve outlook, both from the point of view of symptoms, heart function, and survival in heart failure. The very big, interesting turnaround that took place was in the 90s, when beta blockers started to be used for heart failure. Beta blockers, when I was a student, if you'd were asked in medical finals, you have a patient with heart failure, how do you feel about giving the patient a beta blocker? If you'd said yes, that's a great idea, they'd have said, can you just repeat your answer on that? And they said, yes, I think it's a great idea. They would say, come back in six months, and they would fail you. So it was considered absolutely unacceptable to give a beta blocker to a patient, because in the 80s, the idea was that if the heart was failing, the appropriate approach was to drive it harder, to, to, to whip it into performing They more were more powerful. aggressive, possibly. Well, the approach was that what we call positive inotropy, more powerful contraction was the missing ingredient. Actually, the most interesting thing is that all those studies that looked at drugs that drove the heart harder made people feel better, but actually they died earlier. So there was a, 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 an adverse effect on mortality. They wouldn't prolong life. They shortened life, but people felt a little bit better. The approach of first the ACE inhibitors and then the cautious use of beta blockers, and to be fair, in rather lower doses than had been thought in the previous decades, took things a different way. People felt worse to start with. They felt tired. They might feel a slight increase in breathlessness. But what these drugs were doing was to protect the heart muscle from being overstimulated. 
and gradually through the 90s one after another trial, large-scale trial, established that these drugs were safe and improved mortality and life expectancy. The, the third drug that then uh, was revisited was a drug named spironolactone, mm. which had existed as a diuretic for 30 years already. That also showed benefits in terms of morbidity and mortality. So the concept of heart failure, rather than saying, well, the heart's not beating well, let's flog it a bit harder, that whole idea was dumped, and to use the philosophical term, there was a paradigm shift to having a different concept of the heart, to protect the muscle, to nurture it, to let it get stronger and more efficient. And that actually has shown improvements in survival. So that's why we do treat patients with diuretics symptomatically to relieve them of fluid, but in terms of trying to improve their outlook, we do our best to build up from low doses the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, and these uh, what are called uh, um, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which is spironolactone Spiral. and aplerinone. Aplerinone lately, yeah. which is considered yeah. even better. I have to ask you something, um, and I'm not asking as a doctor because people who are watching us are not mainly doctors. There are many people concerned about adverse reactions, especially regarding beta blockers. People are well informed lately and they come and say, doctor, I have asthma, I have COPD, mm -hmm. I'm a chronic smoker and I'm very concerned in taking beta blockers. Mm -hmm. There was, I think, elders study which mm -hmm. uh, showed that actually um, beta blockers only in acute exacerbation would influence yeah. the, the function of the heart if you, it would be given. But literally, is it correct or not when somebody has asthma or COPD to be given beta blockers? It's a firm question and I have to admit that I have asked so many different cardiology consultants and I get a different answer every time. Well, it's a very, very important question because if you had a young patient with asthma, and I'm being highly specific about asthma, I'm talking about reversible airway constriction, that the, that the airways are jumpy and will tighten and produce wheeze. If you were to give a, a, a substantial dose of a beta blocker to a patient like that, you will unquestionably make them worse. Mm. The, the, the difficult point and particularly since we're talking about patients very often who have been smokers, because the smoking is a common risk factor for COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and for coronary artery disease, is that a lot of those patients do not have asthma. They have emphysematous changes in the lung, they've mm -hmm. lost lung tissue, they might have inflammation from time to time, but the airways themselves are not so um, prone to spasm. So in those patients, the beta blocker will actually be perfectly safe. So I would say if you had any doubt about it, you should send your patient for a formal lung function test with an element of reversibility. In other words, they would um, do the lung function tests under resting conditions and then give a drug like Ventolin to see whether greater relaxation of the airways could so be achieved. Too. And if there is a significant difference, then you've got reversible airway disease, in which case the beta blocker might not be such a good idea. But mm -hmm. broadly speaking, most patients nowadays, A, there's enough of the non-asthma component, and B, the beta blockers themselves, particularly the highly selective ones, will leave the airways alone in general. I see. That's very interesting and very helpful. And... I want now to go to the second part. We discuss about heart failure, definition, causes, diagnostic tools and treatment. If you have nothing else to add, I'm really keen on listening about cardiac oncology because I don't think we have the opportunity to hear much about it. And to be honest, during the years I spent in the department, I didn't um, hear much or I don't know much. And well, I'm, nice I'm, to hear. I'm very happy to tell you a little about that. The, the background to this is that over the last 30 years plus, survival rates from cancer, thank God, are much better than they Because were. of treatments. The treatments have got better, 
we now have combination chemotherapy, we have um, different approaches to rescue patients, for example, where their blood counts have dropped too low, there are rescue regimes to prevent them or reduce the rate of serious infection, and overall the survival rates are much, much better than they were. But there is a limiting factor for quite a number of disorders, uh, and that is that some of the common uh, anti-cancer agents, um, particularly a group called anthracyclines, which are used in the treatment of some, some of the blood cancers and some, to a lesser extent some of the solid tumours, um, are potentially toxic to the heart, fairly lowish rate, two, three, four percent, but when it occurs it's serious. And um, also more recently the uh, use of Herceptin, which Herceptin. is coming in increasing Indeed. usage and of considerable value in treatment, particularly breast cancer, uh, does bring with it uh, some impairment of heart function. Now, to set this in context, the situation is as follows. If we put it very simply, at a time when the expected outlook for a cancer patient was a very short time, it didn't make a lot of difference if you were giving a drug that might be toxic to the heart two, three, four years down the line, because unfortunately it was not expected that the patient would survive. But now, as I say, thank God you've got cures and long, long-term remission where a patient can go 10, 20, 30 years, particularly some of the childhood cancers. The worst possible thing would be if down the line that patient then developed severe heart failure as a consequence of some of the treatments that we used. That would be my next question. What, yeah. Which are the main complications you have? Is it heart failure? Well... What's the toxicity on the heart? The, 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 the different drugs used, there are a number of different toxicities. The, the, in some ways the most important one and the uh, clearest one to understand are the ones that are directly toxic to the heart muscle where you end up with a poorly contracting heart and the mm -hmm. patient will develop heart failure. Now that occurs, as I say, in a small percentage of patients treated with anthracyclines and that response in that situation can be a long-term effect, uh, the treatment of which is Months, pretty difficult. Years? years? Years. Years. Which can be difficult. The, and and uh, one of the pioneers in this field, Michael Ewer from um, Houston, has called that a type 1 reaction. The Herceptin response is numerically a much larger response, it's a higher percentage of patients, but it's much more likely to be reversible mm. and the outlook ultimately will be better. But the added problem is that the aggressive treatment, particularly breast cancer, might be to bring in Herceptin to a patient who has already been treated with an anthracycline. So you get a sort of two-hit situation. I see. And at a molecular level, one of the recovery pathways to the effect of the anthracycline might be being inhibited by the Herceptin. So it's quite complicated it is. in molecular terms. What we, my, I have two close colleagues and myself, uh, we had this, uh, this vision to set up a unit, and it's actually our unit at the Brompton Hospital is the first specific cardio-oncology unit in the UK. Uh, we receive mostly referrals from the Royal Marsden Hospital, but we're happy to receive from a, a wider pool. Um, we are looking at two or three different aspects. There's the cardiomyopathy, which I've just described. You also asked very reasonably, are there other toxicities to the heart caused by other drugs? The answer is yes. Some drugs, for example, can cause coronary spasm and can cause a heart attack effect or a heart attack-like effect. Mm -hmm. Some drugs can alter some of the ECG measures, like the, what we call the QT, QT interval, and increase the risk of irregular rhythms. And some of the newer drugs um, also can produce quite severe hypertension. Uh, 
and that actually might be an effect that gets to the very core of their anti-cancer effect as well. So these, the, 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 the juggling of different effects is quite, quite subtle here. So one thing, we, we wanted to set up a group where we had a primary focus on the risks of chemotherapy. That's one aspect of our work. Another is to look at the patient before the commencement of chemotherapy to see whether the heart is in good condition and will be able to withstand it, or whether there would be an increased risk of complications in a particular group of patients. We are very interested in what we can do to treat the problem if it's there, or anticipate a problem and try and protect the heart in advance. Some of the standard heart failure treatments, like the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, would seem to have a protective role introduced in advance. The other question is whether some blood markers, such as BNP yeah. or troponin, could tell us in advance that a, a patient would be at particular risk of developing a complication, predisposed to it. Which you Ultimately, scans. there will be gen genetic yeah, testing genetic as well. Test, yeah. That might help us. And we do do scans. We do echo frequently, including stress echo in our unit, to look at DSA. contractile reserve. We do a detailed cardiac MRI characterization. And we are setting about building a very sub solid knowledge base to try and build treatments on the back of it. We've got uh, an increasing network of colleagues throughout the country. And this year have set up the British Cardio-Oncology Society, ah, which is a new venture. Congratulations. And is now an affiliate of the British Cardiovascular Society. So we are looking to promote interest and knowledge and understanding in this area uh, on a national scale. We have international colleagues in the International Cardio-Oncology Society and there are various national groups. Uh, we have colleagues in the United States with particular interest in the topic. And we are very keen on partnership with patient groups. We already have a very good relationship with Macmillan in looking at this from the patient perspective as well. So you have a lot of people involved in research as well too. We hope that this would, that we would have a, we, we, we have interests in basic science, but we would like and intend to build up quite a comprehensive research program. The other thing is that there are wider implications of this. If we, we, we are here in the unusual situation of seeing the heart before the cardiomyopathy. So this is unique. It's not the Indeed. situation where the patient necessarily comes with cardiomyopathy and you don't know where it's come from. So because we've got it the other way around, it might give us a model through which to understand other cardiomyopathies uh, in much more detail. So we have new ways in cardiology. Yeah, and it will become a subspecialty, I can imagine. I think so. I think yeah. so. We, we are trying to do this. So when, the uni when is the unit set up already? When yes, we've is, been is running for about three or four years. Three, and four we, years. Uh, three years, really. And uh, we've, we've had a throughput of quite a few hundred patients by now. All right. Mm. Do you want to tell us briefly if you have some outcome, something from this which I, would I, be interesting I to think, learn? I think, I think at this stage what we mainly would encourage is an awareness of the problem and particularly to say that where you have a patient with a known problem affecting the heart, which may just be hypertension, a few years of hypertension, or previous injury, previous uh, heart attack, that there should be a very, very low threshold for investigating the heart before the onset of chemotherapy and for repeated assessments during courses of chemotherapy to make sure that heart function is not declining as a consequence. Is it an awareness towards oncologists mainly? Yes, and to be fair, our, our oncological colleagues are extremely interested in this. I think they feel that it it uh, is uh, supportive of their practice and their protocols do include quite a bit of cardiac testing. Um, but what we are trying to do is to, uh, you know, in the same way as our knowledge of oncology is probably about 20 or 30 years behind that of the leaders in the field, we would like to offer the most up-to-date understanding and the best techniques of imaging to our oncological colleagues. 
That's really amazing. I think what would be useful, because I'm not sure if it has happened already, if we would have a conference with uh, cardiologists and oncologists to discuss these things. Well, there, there have been one or two meetings. There, there certainly the first, the first international meeting of this type was held in Houston uh, about five years ago. I had the, the pleasure and privilege of being present. And our American colleagues are well ahead of us on some of this, as ever. Um, but we are looking to hold such a meeting in the UK in the near future. That would be amazing because mm. I think there will be so many things to be discussed and mm. it's um, renovative, absolutely, and new ways mm -hmm. in cardiology, so many mm -hmm. things to find mm -hmm. out and I think that's the, the beauty. Absolutely. That's the beauty of absolutely. the science. I used to dislike cardiology as a student so how I ended up being involved in so much cardiology, it's fate. That's how I put it. But it's nice because you can find so many yeah. amazing things. I find this really very very important if there is uh, is there anything else you would like to to add i would just encourage all the viewers to know that like with most other areas of medicine the there are quite a few quite simple things that you can do to make heart failure less likely and those are the grandmotherly pieces of advice that i would give you to eat sensibly to exercise to be modest in salt intake, to be modest in alcohol consumption, Very and uh, to have your blood pressure measured from time to time. The, the route to heart failure is, 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 is an easy one, and it depends on a lot of lifestyle factors, many of which it is within our control to do something about. And again, like most things, the the challenge is to appreciate this early enough to do something about. Heart failure is actually a, di a disease in the main of older patients. The average age of presentation with heart failure in my clinics is probably about 75. And it's one of the areas of cardiology where the numbers of patients is increasing, not least because we've been fortunately quite successful in treating other acute problems like heart attacks so that patients can survive to go on to develop this problem. Indeed. Or atrial fibrillation, which very often yeah, leads to heart absolutely. failure. Many patients. But, but a presentation at 75 mm. might have been preventable by a different lifestyle at 50 or 40. That's the challenge. But like with most things, uh, human nature is that when things are going well, you don't particularly think of the of days when it might not. Yes, when things will go wrong yeah. or the other side. That's right. That's very useful. Thank you very much for everything you told us. Not at all. And especially this novelty cardiac oncology, which I'm pretty sure we'll have to say a lot in the future. I hope so. And I hope you, through your very busy program, you might have some time in the future to tell us a bit more about it. I think these things are exciting. Everything new is exciting and challenging. Um, once again, thank you for everything. My great pleasure. Thank you for My inviting me. My great pleasure and honor having you here tonight. Κυρίες και κύριοι, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που μας παρακολουθήσατε απόψε. Ήταν μια ξεχωριστή εκπομπή. Ε, εύχομαι να μας παρακολουθήσετε με το ίδιο ενδιαφέρον σε επόμενες εκπομπές μας. Ραντεβού κάθε Κυριακή στις 7.30. Καλό σας βράδυ.